control, um, control automation network. And these two are designed for encapsulation of DMX controls in a IP packet. Um, both of them can use, with having that and having Ethernet, uh, you have the ability then to use traditional switches, traditional routers, internet routing packets. Uh, a lot of these are done through uh, UDP packet strings, but because you have that sort of encryption, that, that sort of uh, capitalization of those, you can now support a lot cheaper devices and installations, not have to worry about daisy chains or expensive off the isolators. Um, you can create uh, or spanning trees and other options to protect yourself against uh, losses and connection. When it comes to Ethernet and then wireless DMX, if you go into like eBay and you search, you find a wireless DMX controller or web wireless DMX uh, connection. You're most likely are using a uh, frequency helping to spread spectrum. Bad, okay, um, because it uh, blows out Wi Fi, okay, and Wi Fi is the other standard. Wi Fi is going to look better design. Um, from there. From there, I have a demo. We can take a look at some of these things. And uh, if you guys want to come up and show you what they are, if you any questions, I can answer them. That's pretty much it. Um, I 
stuff for the alarm. Well, this is the DRX controller. Basically, this will send eight channels of the DMX signal out and ignores the rest of them. Um, what it basically do is they'll send zeros for the rest. The first channel um, is set up as red. These different uh, instruments can choose to be on a one channel, two channel, three channel, four channel, five channel, six channel, seven channel. Seven channel. Each one of them having different controls, and that's why we didn't talk too much about it because every manufacturer and every device has different standards right? and how many how they utilize the channel spectrum. So the pages in the book, how many different channels are going to go on? This one, what I've set up are three, and turn it on to the starting channel being the first channel. So one is red, two is green, and of course three bring you somewhat of light, um, blue. Uh, you bring them up in different varying amounts. Zero and uh, up to 255. And if I was to look at right the analyzer and actually pull the signal, you'd see that it would go from uh, zero and pick any particular signal that comes in there. And of course, you can pick it from there. These are more of the older designs of controllers. They used to be, when a DMX controller, when you have a, uh, an actual theater, you would have two banks of all the particular demos that you'd be operating from. And so you'd have an X and a Y. And so the first scene, you would turn on the particular lights and make it look how you want. Bring the faders up, which would be cross um, invert link from each other. And you bring it all the way up to uh, the top, which would bring up X. And as you pull it down, you bring up Y, which would be the next channel. And so while, when you run Y, you could reset X and fade to X, and reset Y, fade to Y, reset X, so on and so forth. And you do that throughout the entire show. From there, we came. Um, computerized controls, uh, programming and scenes, and then uh, programming fade times also. This, uh, this one is uh, one of the cheapest and earliest devices I purchased. Uh, this one actually, you can see, is exact, does pretty much the exact same thing, just wider LEDs. They don't use a, a um, tri LEDs, each one is LEDs. Color rather than being three and one, so it creates more of a skittle effect, and I can turn it on in a second. But you can actually see that there are 10, 10 dip switches in here. You go one all the way to 56, and then on. So if you turn this one in off and turn it into so it's on the on mode, it would do its automation to mean that my blink get my turn on preset color and stay the way with no cable attached to it. Paid software, um, and then they've also got closed source stuff that does not use 
devices like Martin and the light drop. And, um, the American DJ designs, etc. On the video side, if you read the notes, it takes the light out of it. You can lock a lot of the programs. Can take audio inputs, so if you use this as trigger points to trigger the next scene, you can use it for sequencing of the MIDI. So it wait as a MIDI instrument, wait for it to construct, and then um, then go to the next scene. Is this what they use a lot of uh, bands that have a road trip and stuff? That set up? A lot of the bands and road trips, what will they'll do is they will have uh, preset designs for particular portions of the show, and they still have a live operator. Hitting those particular notes. Since the band is so live and volatile, most bands don't play, you know, they're not recording. Um, what I can tell you is that all the production shows that you see, like um, uh, you go to like, Disney World or you go to Six Flags or something like that, all of these are all preset. They're all written, recorded, ready to go. When they start, they put literally push play and the production just locks, including the lighting itself. When I went to the Red Out concert, they had like Yep, they'd be all set to go, and then, then the lighting designer would have spent time listening to Weird Al's set, listening to what he's going to, he might be doing, and, and then have stuff, and then he also have lighting stuff. Yep, and they, and they would run through a couple of those things, and that's why, you know, still that needs to follow spot operators to be able to control. You can control these things down to know where a person's going to go, and it's like, a lot of them go on off pilots for smaller bands. Yeah. Larger bands that will think of they'll probably don't have sync them all together and bring them together. Yeah, it's, if, if they believe that light and design is important. Well, I mean, I've, I've seen that with a lot of bands where you know they'll have like maybe six or eight of those, you know, front stage or backstage, and you know they'll they'll kind of do this like synchronous kind of thing where it like, comes up at the center stage or whatever, and um, that, that's all got to be pre-programmed and right? Yeah, all of those are all pre-programmed into a particular effect, and that particular effect then can be called a point. So we want to we want to pan up, and then they can choose, well, they've got a particular element of saying, okay, pan up, and what we want to do is pan up with blue, and boom, blue, pan up. And then we want to do battle, which is like figure eights in the sky. Um, we want to do those, we want to do one, we want to do uh, a flashing, and you can so choose a whole group to include in that particular um, set. It's not uh, weird out, or not weird out. A bunch of them have like a few green and green laser and a lot of green. Do you have those two programs as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's an all like, the X and Y. Usually those will also use uh, 16 bits, so they'll interleave the two signals together and then let them know exactly where they're going to go. And that way they can actually, you can actually draw, provided you, you can stay with limitations of 44. Um, samples per second, you can draw a whole uh, bigger face or whatever. I was just going to say, the dinner pack behind them, um, first of all, all of those are auto loaded.
the problem is you, the amount of line that you've got in the H1 or the instruments, they do have uh, certain tolerances that come with like the other bunch of 500 uh, meters. They don't want you to uh, load the various devices without having a clip repeater or an isolate or something to repeat the same redesign it. Um, but yeah, you could, you could run a small amount of LEDs or small signals that come along, especially if you have a large environment and you wanted to use, say, the fourth and fifth. Uh, pins, which are in the uh, five-pin cable. Um, the problem is that five-pin cable also costs more. So the cable that I opt for is three-pin, but it's designed for DMX use. So it's 110 ohms, 22 gauge or wire, uh, very very durable. But it only has three strands in it and an outer sheet of shield that comes along with it. Uh, so drain, plasma, and then uh, yes, um, the grading. The actual uh, rating on the cable is much different. Actually, probably microphone cable here, and you can see that this one. Uh, <coughs> this one the that cable is much different than this one. It, that one does not have a, an actual shield that runs along it. This one will have both of them have drains, both of them have three cables, cause them to take the power and balance the signal running. But you can. Very, very short ones. Short ones. It's not going to damage anything, but the signal is going to become muddled. You're going to have a lot of reflect reflection down the line. If you plug that in, like, the microphones are using a light. If you put, if you plug it into a mixer, um, if you plug a light into a mixer, like a sound mixer, and it was running phantom power, which is 48 volts, which is standard. If you did that, you would send 48 volts down, and it's only expecting six. And you just don't shoot your control circuit. Yeah, you just filled your receiver so that would turn that's it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 I'm sure you could. Yeah. But most people, if you're like ever seen the, the Christmas house or the Halloween house that they light up and everything else, they're using a combination of these uh, set in replay packs. So instead of being dimming, they're just similar just, uh, on off, which are much cheaper. Uh, they'll use uh, Arduinos. Take an Arduino shield and pop it on top and actually get a DMX uh, signal that runs from that and they'll just daisy chain it right to the house uh, outside. You mean like for the uh, Christmas light show where they have black sound and go into the DMX? Oh, absolutely. Uh, that's, that's, this is exactly what they use. This is what more Halloween not much houses. Exact same thing. Uh, haunted. Uh, it's not one of them. It's the DLC. Yeah. So. But uh, yeah, that's kind of a What are the problems? What are the problems? This one here? This is a mover. Um, give me a second. Point the fan back into the actual outlet. This is how it's helpful. Fans help them. So like I said, what it's doing is it's uh, calibrating its, its position because these all use rotary encoders to determine where their location is. They need to go to the stop point to determine how far they've gone. So it's going all the way over, stop, 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 stop. The um, separate rotor knows that it's at that particular point and then it can know exactly how many steps it needs to go around. And now, right now it's doing internals. So it'll actually be changing out the moving the prisms. The gobos will sit here and um, and rotate around in particular sets. And now it's all the stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that has to be a lot. Remember when I was talking about light sensors? Each of these is a light sensor. It's called gobos. Right. It's one of those in four pockets. Um, you know, there's one in the prism. It's making a bigger three of them. Can you get custom ones? We get one from the outside and put a dog on it. <laughs> you sure can get custom ones. You can get a custom steel gobo cup for about $59. Um, glass, which allows you to color the light um, and possibly get more up to the product of us. Um, we get a custom for our clients all the time for the news, by the way. Just like whether they're wedding conference or whatever. Um, so I'm actually getting a, we're actually getting one custom for this week for a client who's a very yeah, that's what I was asking about. Laser <coughs> cutting. Yeah, we can cut it out of the laser cutting. Oh, one that started. Oh, yeah. 